All right, so it's the midnight, and I'm gonna redo this final lecture because I forgot to turn on my microphone during the day. And now it's like midnight, and I'll do it again, and with the more, with more clear logic and more clear explanations. All right. So this is our final lecture. We have lemma first, and we the main focus for this lecture is two theorems. One is the Scully Arzela, which is like a function version of Bolzano Weierstrass. Second is the Stone Weierstrass theorem, and it's basically um, take you can have a polynomial and convert this to a function. For any function, you can find a polynomial sequence that converges uniformly. All right. So. All right. So first. We're gonna start with the lemma. And lemma states that if a set is compact, then you can always find a con countable subset that is dense in the set. So we're gonna review the definition of dense. So, so either the point is a limit point of E or a point of E or both. <coughs> okay. So to prove this theorem, first for each N, who is associated with a set Bn, a collection of open balls, like this, and here n is the variable of the radius, and x has been taken all over all the sets. And obviously, this is the open cover of a uh, of k, right? And by the compactness of k, you can have it always find a subcover for every n, find a sub finite subcover, right? Now, we form a new set by a countable union of all the ANs and denote the union B A. Now is a union is a countable union of finite sets, so it's countable. And it's a subset of K obviously because each of them covers K, so the union of them also covers K. Right? And each of them is a subset of each of I mean, every set N A is a subset of K, right? So the union is also like so it's obvious, right? It's a countable subset of K. And now we want to show that A is dense in K. Well, what that means is that, okay, so first we pick X and K, and we consider any delta, uh, delta neighborhood around X. And by the Archimedean principle or property, there exists at N such that one over N is less than epsilon. And it's a natural number. All right. Now, as a n covers k, right? We have this is n such that this is true, and also a this a n covers k. So we know that for for x and k, we can find a such that x n is in some one over n neighborhood of a. Well, this is equivalent saying that a is in the one over n neighborhood of x. Right? Now, we have A is in the neighborhood of X and it's also in AN. Right? Now, AN is a subset of A. Right? And this is a subset of this. Right? And we have an A that is in this. So, we either have X is equal to A, or then there's nothing to prove. Or, this shows that x is a limit point of a, and we're done, okay? Then we're gonna use this lemma for this theorem. It's the function version of balls down and worse rest. This theorem says that, okay, if k is compact and you have a bunch of continuous functions and each of them is pointwise bounded and equicontinuous, so they're not continuous, they're equicontinuous. Then we can have the fact that it's uniformly bounded and it contains a uniformly convergent subsequence. So, so if, if we have compact, complex value, pointwise bounded, and equicontinuous, then we have uniformly bounded and a uniformly convergent subsequence. It's really cool, right? So, um, first, we should prove part A. 
Well, by the equal continuity, we let epsilon greater than zero, we pick a delta such that for any n, for any x light, if they're delta close, we have this inequality, <laughs> right? This is the equal continuity. And we, if we cover k with the delta neighborhood of all x and k, well, then by the compactness, we have a finite subcover covers k. Now, also, as each of them is pointwise bounded, right? So for each x i, we have an m i such that this is true for all n. We're just listing out properties here. Now, for any x and k, we must have this is true for some i because it covers k, right? Now, we have fn minus fn x, x minus um, f, fn x minus fn xi, right? Well, x and xi, they're delta close. If they're delta close, then we have the equal continuity, right? So this should be less than epsilon. Well, if you do the triangle inequality, right? Which is, uh, the, the whole thing is less than equal to this plus this. And this thing is less than uh, equal to mi. Right. And here's the inequality. Or you can have like fn of x minus fn of xi. This is greatly equal to fn x minus fn xi. And then this is less than epsilon. For this and this, using the fact that this is less than equal to mi right but anyway if you pick m become their maximum then for any x and for any n we have this is true right because for mi right this is obvious for any x there is some i so for any x and k we have some i and we take in all for m1 until mn we take their maximum then for any x and for any n right we have this is true well this means that fn is uniformly bounded right and now i'm gonna prove part b i have a convergence uniform convergence subsequence and by the lemma, we know that there exists a subset of k such that countable and dense of k, the lemma we just proved. <laughs> now, also we have fn is uniformly bounded on k, then it's uniformly bounded on e, then it is pointwise bounded on e. <laughs> so, we apply this theorem. Pointwise bounded on a countable set that has a subsequent coverage pointwise for every e. Which one was the theorem, right? Now, we put fnk to equal to gk for to simplify our notation, and we want to show that this converges uniformly, right? We have a we have a subsequence that converges uniformly, and so we want to show that this converges uniformly. Now, with using the condition that is equicontinuity, so we let epsilon greater than zero, we pick a delta as before. And we know that there exists n such that for any n, for any x, y, n, if they're delta close, we have this is true. Right. Well, these seems like redundant. No, no, no. We don't need this what I'm doing here, right? For n, for any n, for any x, y, such that if they're delta close, we have this is true, right? The equal continuity. Now we cover E. We cover it by the delta, the delta neighborhood of E for all elements of E. Now, 
what we have now is that e is dense in k, right? Which means that for any x and k, we either have x is in e or x is the limit point of e. If x is in e, then it's in the, uh, the, 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 the union, right? The union of neighborhoods. If this is the limit point, then we know that for this neighborhood, you know, there is an e such that e is in e is in the neighborhood. Well, e in this neighborhood, which is equivalent to saying x is in this neighborhood. Well, if x is in this neighborhood, then it's in the union of all such neighborhoods, right? So, for any x and k, we we all gonna have that x is in the union of this, which means that this is open cover of k. By the compactness, we have a finite subcover. Now, as GUI converges pointwise on E, right? We know that there exists N such that for any IJ greater than N, we have this is true, right? For any E, for any ES, right? For any ES, there exists an N. Right. Now, using the fact that it is equicontinuity, let's add it here for any e, for any e s. This is n such that the Cauchy condition, right? The Cauchy condition. Now, again, use the fact that f n f n is equicontinuous. That means that for x and k. We must have x is in some delta neighborhood of E because it covers, right? For some s. Because <laughs> it's countable, right? Now, x and E, s, they're delta close. What this says that if they're delta close, remember f, f is equi equicontinuous, right? If they're delta close, which means that the difference of their function output, of their function, sh should be epsilon close to each other, right? And this is true for any i, because equicontinuous, right? Now, what we have is that for any i j greater than n, so this holds for any i, and this holds for any i j greater than n. So we just let i j greater than n then we have both of them are true, right? Now, then for any x and k, we have this is less than equal to this plus this plus this using the triangle inequality. Well, this is less than epsilon. This is less than epsilon because it's equicontinuity, right? They're delta close. Right, and this is less than epsilon because the coverage is pointwise. And again, oh, whoa, whoa, whoa. And again, this is less than epsilon because this equicontinuity combined gives three epsilon. Well, this means that we have a Cauchy condition for uniform convergence. So it converges uniformly. Well, here we have the last theorem of this course. <coughs> If we have a continuous function on interval a b, then we have a then we have a sequence of polynomials such that it converges to the function uniformly on a b. Well, to prove this, we're gonna make three assumptions. We're gonna make three assumptions. All right. So first assumption is to put a b to zero one. Why? With the laws of generality. Oh, if the theorem holds for g on zero to one. They would define a new function f on a b such that this is true. So if we define gx equal to f of this, then we know when g is taken 0, f is on a, right? If g goes to 1, then it becomes it becomes b, right? And if we're between 0 and 1, this is going to be between A and B, right?
Well, if j is equal to this, then we have by function transformation, we have fx is equal to this, which is equal to g of this. Well, if the theorem holds for g on 0, 1, then we have p of this, p of this thing converts to g of this thing, right? And this is equal to x. But this is still a polynomial, right? Now, second assumption is we assume that f0 and f1 is equal to 0, basically like this. Oh, why? Because if uh, other case, if you have something like this, right, then you take their difference of the linear function, then f1 is basically f2 subtract this linear function, right? <laughs> well, if the theorem is true for f1, then we have pn converges f1. Then we have pn plus the linear function. It converges to f2, right? Look at this. If pn plus the linear converges to f2, but a linear function is still a polynomial. So which is a still a polynomial? A polynomial converges to f2, right? So we can still make this assumption. It doesn't matter. And the third assumption is that that fx is equal to zero for all other outputs. <laughs> well, this is taken so that it's uniform continuous on R because it's already continuous on a, on a compact set, right? So it's uniformly continuous. And they take all everything equal to zero. This is again, uniformly continuous, which can be shown easily, but I'm not gonna prove it here. All right, so now here we're gonna start. Uh, listen carefully. We're gonna first analyzing a function q and an x, which is a, a a polynomial, right? But this polynomial is not the polynomial that converges to f. We, we're first gonna study something like this first. Well, we put q and x equals to c of n times this on negative one to one, and the cn is chosen such that the integral is equal to 1. So basically, the, the thing inside is equal to 1, right? Now, when n gets big, the, the, the graphic is going to be look like this. And we're still going to make the cn such that the whole thing is equal to 1, the area, all right? <laughs> now, so as n gets really large, you'll get something like, this or even or even more like uh, something like this or even 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 worse right so, so, something like this well the the area inside is still equal to one <laughs> all right now for the cn we're gonna first introduce a Bernoulli's inequality, which is taught in my calculus class. Well, the proof is easy by induction, right? So the inequality states that if A is greater than negative one, then we have this inequality holds for all that positive integer n. Okay, so we're gonna analyze Cn first. Now, if we take integral of this thing, it's equal to two times from zero to one, why? Because this is an even function, right? It's an even function, we, they're like symmetric. We just consider the positive case and we multiply by two, which is from negative one to one. This is straightforward, right? And then as the function value is always positive, if we decrease their upper bound of integral, then the integral should be decreasing, right? Right now, from here to here, we use the Bernoulli's inequality. So, for x between zero and one over n less than one, if s squared is less than one, which means that negative s squared is greater than negative one. Now, this gets this, which means that one minus x squared to the n is greater than this 
right? Like the square. Well, if their function has an inequality, so does their in integral has the inequality. This is the property of integral, and I proved in lecture twenty or let nineteen the properties of integrals. All right, and now for this, we just compute their integral, and here just the computation. This boom boom turns out to be equal to four or three root n, which is greater than one over root n. Now, which means that qn x dx, the whole thing, the integral is equal to one, right? Which is cn times the integral. The cn times this integral, right? cn times this integral is greater than cn. Um, uh, greater than cn times uh, root n, right? <laughs> we're, we're good, right? 1 is greater than this, and it gives this. Now, we have this. We're going to use it later. Now, we're going to analyze. We know that we want to show that. So, it's like, because remember... For q, the function gets big. I'm going to show that somewhere around he somewhere around here. We're gonna have q n goes to zero. Right? It's like, okay. So now, for any delta greater than zero, for delta for x, is oh, something like this. So basically, this is x. This is delta, right? This is negative one one, right? <laughs> we combine with this inequality. First, we have this true, is equal to this. Good. It's less than this. Using this, using this. Now, this is by this, okay? <laughs> now, which means that q and x greater than equal to zero and less than equal to this, but the limit of this is equal to zero <laughs> right and by squeeze theorem the limit as n goes to infinity is equal to zero but for any x right for any x which means that it converges uniformly to zero on on this uh on this set on this set okay now we're gonna start our work of approximating f so we let p and x is equal to this okay i know it's kind of it's kind of tedious but okay <laughs> now we note that f the function f is not zero only when its output is between zero and one right not even it's like it's like just between them right which means that right <laughs> but it doesn't matter just if you take it uh, still still doesn't matter but what we but the key thing is that between for t between them f is not zero other than that, f is equal to zero, right? So, instead of conserve t from negative one, from negative one to one, we just consider t from negative x to one minus x, because other than that, this is equal to zero. The integral is gives zero, which is like contribute nothing to our entire integral, right? So this, so this is equal to this, right? Now, we're going to do our change of variable. So, I just I change of variable. So, if this whole thing is equal to gx, we like phi t equals to t minus x, or negative x plus t, then we know that phi 0 is equal to negative x, and phi 1 is 1 minus x. Right? And this thing is equal to 
from 0 to 1 of g of phi t times phi prime t times dt, right? And you just sub in. You just sub in. And this gives you this. Now. And you sub in again, gives you this. Well, which means that you can put the CN outside, right? It gives you this. Well, this this thing, this thing is a polynomial in X, right? Because the thing inside is a polynomial in T, where X is a constant. And then if you multiply FT to this whole thing, right? And then when you're taking integrals, you can take X outside. And the x to some power, right, times an integral of random thing dt. This whole thing is going to give you a real number, which is xn times something r. Right, again and again, this is a polynomial in x. <laughs> right? And what I want to show that is this p and x. Now, p n converges to f uniformly. On zero to one, right? On zero one. Now, as f is uniformly continuous on R, right? Which means that for any uh, epsilon can pick a delta such that for any y x between them, if they're delta close, then they're function value is epsilon over 2 close and we can set delta is less than 1 so we can pick a delta such that this holds this holds and also it's less than 1 okay now we let m be the supremum of f of x because fx is bounded right it's continuous on some compact interval so its image it's also compact, which is closed and bounded. All right. Now, for any x on zero one, right? Note that we we know that q n covers zero uniformly. We we'll prove it right here, right? We can choose n such that. For any f sum greater than zero, we can choose an n such that for any n greater than n, and for any t like this, we have q and t is less than epsilon over four m. The m is this one. All right, this is doable because q and t covers uniformly on to zero on this interval. All right. So if you take your difference. If they take their p and x, <laughs> p this is direct substitution, and this is multiplied by one. This is like a magic part. This whole thing is equal to one, right? This whole thing is equal to one. <laughs> we define it like this. Now, we can take the we can take the integral inside, right? And the integral. The, the absolute value of integral is less than the integral of absolute, absolute value, right? And as q and t, they're greater than zero, it becomes this, right? Now, for negative one to one, we split it into two intervals. One is when uh, the absolute value t is less than delta, and one is other than that. Okay, well, for the red part, we're going to use the uniform continuous condition. And for this part, obviously, we're going to use the convergent to zero condition. All right, now, for this delta, right, we have this thing less than epsilon 2. So we can take it out. And plus, well, this so this this is less than equal to fx uh, whatever 
So the, the, the f, right, is less than or equal to their sum of absolute values, and it's less than or equal to m plus m, right? So this thing is less than or equal to 2m, right? And now for this, we know that q and t is greater than zero when on this interval, right? So it's gonna increase the value if we integral, if we integrate more, um, more on the domain, right? You, you, you know what I'm saying, right? Because this is, this one's a, it's a longer one. There's a bigger integral because this is greater than equal to zero. This is obvious, right? And this, we just keep it same. And then for this, remember it converges to zero. So this thing, no, this thing, this thing is going to be, um, this thing, this thing is going to be arbitrary small, right? It's going to be less than, less than equal to epsilon over 4m and integrated dt all right well th this is like you know what i'm saying but well th the thing inside is going to be less than equal to some constant times the the, the integrated oh th something here is wrong but okay so this this is like epsilon over i don't know c something some small over c all right well, the C can be taken so that the integral of this is less than the whole thing is like epsilon over 2, right? Well, this becomes 1. This whole thing becomes 1, right? This whole thing becomes 1 epsilon over 2 here yeah. and for this is 2m times something and <clears throat> the thing inside is can be less than epsilon over c epsilon over c epsilon over c and you integrate it with this domain and well it, it can be adjusted such that the thing is less than epsilon over 2 right it's less than epsilon well it gives the whole thing is less than epsilon, the whole difference. Well, okay, now if we start from the very beginning, right, we say that for any epsilon greater than zero, we choose an n, such that for any n and n, and for any x between zero and one, we also choose a delta, but the delta is like, right, such that such that this is the revenue close, which means that this converges uniformly on zero one. If a polynomial converges to a function, the this value function, uniformly on an interval, and we're done. And we're done with this course. This is the last theorem. And still, last but not least, I want to. Thank to my girlfriend. Um, she supported me. I'm using her iPad apparently to record all my 24 lectures. And I really, really, I, I thank her really much. All right, I love her. She's the best. And yeah, this is the end of mathematical. So medical and now the sys or proof based based single variable calculus and the end right we're, we're done.
is a the downside climax, right? There's a huge proof. It's indeed a huge proof, right? Look at this. And I'm gonna do hopefully I will start my multivariable multi variable calculus. Maybe somewhere like around twenty twenty four January, hopefully. Hopefully. And again again. Again and again. Right. We're done with single variable calculus. Single variable calculus, we're done. Look at this work, bruh. Look at all these work we've done. All the theorems are proved. Right? Again, before I leave, I still want to say thank you to my girlfriend, Emma. Using her iPad, she's so rich. I'm, I'm broke. She supported me no matter what. And she's the best.